are here for Military Culture. My name is Mike, I'm the moderator, and I'm continuing the tradition of being the least qualified person on this panel. So I'm gonna start on my left, and we're gonna go to the right. Um, let's start with you. Jim Curtis, uh, retired Naval officer, Mustang, came up through the ranks. Call sign was Cajun, Naval Aviator. Pete Nealon, former recon Marine, eight years, Iraq and Afghanistan. And not uh, right. So I'm Clark Chamberlain, um, 10 years Army, uh, tour to Iraq. It was lovely. And, uh, <laughs> and actually, I started writing uh, while I was there, and it just continued on ever since. Cool. David? I'm David Belt, uh, B 52 pilot, Air Force, call sign SAR 32. Um, then some time in the Air National Guard as an air weapons controller. It's kind of like a forward air controller, only we get to stay back a little ways. <laughs> and, uh... All right. Sounds amazing. Okay, so let's actually, I want to hit you guys really quickly. Um, the, the, the panel description for this panel actually tells you more of what it's not than what it is. So can I, just really quick, um, um, like summary here. Where you guys, what, what do you guys want to get from this panel? Obviously, we have really good pros here on my left and my right, so I can, this can go many ways. I, I, I'd like to note the um, lingo associated with lingo. military and with. Uh, All right, well, that can go. Well, in, that, in that case, like I want to talk can't... about bionic suits in my novel, or you know, things like that, and I want to, I, I want to be able to talk about. So maybe you, you well, want. Well, more like, what groups are there? Are there like. You want more like how does how the structure the the awesome. structure the lingo. <laughs> Well, yeah. I guess so we're, just, we're just we're just pulling questions right now, okay. and then we'll, we'll get we'll get the questions. Anybody else? So, if there's time, some of the I'd be interested in the non-military aspect of the military experience. So, when you're out of uniform, or how the oh, okay. local flora, fauna, other things affect your military experience. Okay. Um, there's a couple else? things I want to know. First off, what what is it like, like from I guess the bottom to the top? When you were lower rank, uh, how does that feel versus higher rank? What's the difference? What things are you able to get away with when you're higher rank? <laughs> <laughs> things like that. Um, and also for minorities in no, we definitely don't. No, we're gonna try. women or. Uh, Minority groups. Uh, what are, is their experience? Are they looked down upon? What struggles might they face? Okay, for sure. All right. I think we can. Yeah, we got a good breadth. We got a broad set of topics that we can totally yeah, go ahead. Over here. Okay. Differences between different branches. Branch. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, <laughs> obviously, obviously, they're all going to tell you that their branch is the best. So <laughs> well, clearly, like, colloquialisms are like you know lifestyle. Okay, last one. Let's go with that. Oh, like, like, uh, you know, we all have this sort of idea of how the military works from film and television and books and stuff. Like, it's all lies. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's what, the truth? What, what, what should we know that that Common wrong mistakes. about all of that? Sure. And actually, I think that's actually it's a really, a really good, good starting point question. So the first question I'm going to field our experts is, um, what does military culture mean to you? And how does mainstream media typically get it wrong? Let's start with you, Jim. I'm just to keep it like two minutes. Let's try to keep it two minutes. I know, like, I know we can speak forever, but yeah. well, this, this the panel's a time limit. <laughs> the Navy is actually three separate cultures. There is a surface culture, an aviation culture, and a submarine culture. Three entirely different organizations in, under one hat. The problem is that it, the Navy, literally puts the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> because they all fight. We're all going after the same pot of money. You never have enough. I flew in helicopters and then long range patrol for 20, 21 and a half years all over the world. The culture becomes a lifestyle in that, you know, I look out and half the time I can pick somebody out what service by their haircut. <laughs> I still have a high and tight, just never got in a long hair. Dealing with people, you learn how to deal with various cultures, not by choice, but because you have to. We as deployers traveled all over the world. We were based six months at a time, usually outside the States. Interacted with Germans, Japanese, Australians, 
Brits, uh, Italians, that's a lot of fun, the Turks, uh, the Saudis, you know, you name it. So you learn all the different cultures. You learn the do's and don'ts. And you learn, probably the most important thing, is how to be polite to people in their culture. That's probably one of the takeaways. The Marine Corps essentially has two subcultures. Grunts and everyone else. <laughs> and grunts don't even like each other very much. Grunt, grunts live to kill people, break their shit, and when not killing people or breaking their shit, drinking and womanizing. That's pretty much what it boils down to for your average enlisted grunt. That is life. That is, my life sucks so much that my weekend is drinking as much beer as possible to try and blot out the week before and lessen the anticipation of the week to come because I'm a boot and all I get to do is clean the hallways, mop the uh, tarmac in the rain because I screwed up and my platoon leader hates me. That's a lot of the life of a grunt. The vast majority of military life is soul-crushing boredom. <laughs> soul-crushing boredom. In case I didn't get that across quite well enough. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of uh, physical exertion, and there's a lot of bitching. Bitching, griping, moaning, complaining is actually considered a good sign. One of my first, my first team leader once said, if Marines ain't bitching, there's something wrong. Because that's when the dead face comes on and you start to thinking about suicide watch. Cool, Clark, can we hit that uh, Yeah, so for the US Army, um, kind of a lot of the same type of stuff. You know, we have our nice little culture in there and uh, trying to think of some specific examples. Uh, I worked in cavalry brigades uh, and artillery and also with like uh, protection and working with dogs on EOD, not EOD, um, ECP. Those are some of your things you'll probably want to know. Entry like control point. Entry control point. And then, you know, and you just toss around all these acronyms all the time. Yeah. Um, but you know, like with the Army, one of the things that I've always loved about the culture of the Army is just like, I've got guys that I can call on, you know, for anything. Like, and it doesn't matter if it's day or night, it doesn't matter if they're across the country. Like, they're there for me. Yep. And that is something that you don't find out in the regular world. I don't like what to... That's true of the Marine Corps, too. But yeah. we'll, we'll cuss you out while we're, <laughs> while we're helping you out. And it's a whole other language. Like, I, I don't have a lot of uh, profanity in my language when I'm in regular world stuff. But when I'm there, like, everything becomes profanity involved it's, with it. Because it's just part of the language of talking to my fellow soldiers. It's yeah. not even description or substitution. There, somebody, there, there's a there's a running joke about how the f bomb can be every single word in a sentence. It can be a verb, noun, noun an adverb, an, an adjective. And it's the, not even to that point. It's punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> and like Pete was saying about boredom, you know, like you sit around waiting for something to have waiting. We got to get up at you know zero four hundred so we can get to the airport and sit there for the next fourteen hours. Is that what I call that? Hurry up and wait. Yeah, hurry up and wait. But that also has led to some of the most interesting philosophical conversations <laughs> I have ever had in my entire life. Because this wind is not leading yeah. to extremely destructive shenanigans. <laughs> because the most yeah. dangerous thing in the world is a handful of bored Marines. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, board anyway. So it, it's a lot of fun though, like with, with that. And uh, you would not get that in any other type of job. You know, that you have time to just sit around and think about stuff and like, oh, what about this? You know, and like come up with all these what if type scenarios and these big conversations because, and it's another thing I love about the Army, and I, I think probably you guys do it the same way, is the uniform. The uniform removes all of our past. You know, it doesn't matter where you came from. You got the uniform on, all of a sudden you're even, in a way. And it breaks down those things to have conversations with people you would not approach, maybe in your regular life, because of how they dressed or how they look or whatever. So, David? There's a joke in the Air Force, the uh, navigator dies and goes up to heaven, he's waiting by the pearly gates, waiting for his turn to come in, and some guy walks up in a flight suit, and he's got a 
He's got a G suit which wraps around your legs and squeezes the blood to keep you from blacking out. He's got a G suit thrown over his shoulder, and he's got two days' growth of beard, and, and his flight suit is undipped down, zipped down to his navel, and he just walks up and he belches really loudly, and he swaggers into heaven. And uh, the, the navigator says, well, How come he gets to go? And he says, Oh, that's just God. He just thinks he's a fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of describes the culture. Pilots think they can get away with everything. That's pilot. Pilots think they can get away with everything. Navigators are the lowest of the low, <laughs> in spite of the fact that it takes a heck of a lot more study, and in some cases a lot more work for them to get that. But I happen to be blessed with the eyes. And um, so I got to be a pilot. And the, But the vast majority of the Air Force are not pilots. So there's pilots, kind of air crews, and everybody else. <laughs> and it's, that's not right, but that's, that's the way it, it works. Air Force sees itself as a more civilized service. <laughs> the they, they used to, service. We used to be, we had to wear uniforms every, I mean, you know, we, we were supposed to look like the blue, Air Force, blue airlines, you know. We had to wear uniforms everywhere. And then all of a sudden we got a new uh, general command of the uh, new four-star general command of the, uh, the, of, the, the, of the Joint Chiefs over the Air Force, and he was a fighter pilot. And he said, are we serious? We're warriors. Let's start dressing like warriors. So suddenly we're wearing BDUs, battle dress uniforms, and flight suits were acceptable everywhere, but they take, the, they take aviation safety extremely seriously. You walk out onto a flight line wearing your hat and you're going to have some lieutenant, some colonel, somebody get in your face and say, you're trying to get me killed. Your hat's going to get sucked into a jet engine. <clears throat> and he's not going to be nice about it. Uh, I didn't see as much swearing <laughs> unless it was the colonel and he wanted to make a point. <laughs> like swearing at the entire squadron because somebody used a bad word in public. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can say that, you know, there's, there's a lot of structure, right? There's a lot of structure. There's a lot of, there's a feeling of extended family. There's a lot of feeling of, like, I would say friendly animosity slash competition between different services and different, like, even different structures within your service. Well, to give a perfect example, uh, what you said about being a pilot in the Air Force, they control everything. In the Navy, I was a what they call a naval flight officer. So I told pilots where to go, how to get there, and sometimes even did it politely. <laughs> when we would go to an Air Force base, I would sign for the airplane. Because in the Navy, that's part of my job as a mission commander is to sign for the airplane. The Air Force would go bat nuts because you can't do that. No, son. I'm Navy. I'm not Air Force. <laughs> the least person skilled, command skilled, pilot is the aircraft commander, yeah. period. And if somebody on his crew screws up, he pays for it. Whereas in the Navy, yeah. as a naval flight officer, if I'm the senior guy, the mission commander, it's my airplane. <laughs> so it's the little things like that, that the different services have different perspectives, and we constantly play that against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a friendly competition. I, I, I think mostly. I mean, sometimes we get missions. But... All, right. All right. Well, let's, let's actually fuel the question that nobody seems to answer. Um, what does mainstream media typically get wrong? Let's let's go. I know this is a... Uh, um, like, everything. <laughs> 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 Obviously, that's an easy question. But let's try hitting a mainstream media that you know people have reference, like movies, books, etc. And then let's just talk about maybe a few points on how to get it wrong. Let's start with you, Clark. All right. So, like, The Hurt Locker. The... Which I love. Just about everything in that movie is incorrect. <laughs> so, like, you've got an EOD guy that's going out there, and there's that scene where he pulls up all of the artillery shells. And I, I work artillery. Those shells, you're like 90 pounds a piece. He's pulling up five or six of them. So what is that, like 500 pounds he's lifting with one hand? 
He's pulling him but out he's of the ground. But he's a Jeremy Renner. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. You know, and, and uh, you know, add to that that uh, you know bombs shouldn't be really touched and moved around like that <laughs> because mm -hmm. of, of you know sensitive uh, trip wires and things like that. So that's a big issue um, in that movie that they just and they're always off by themselves. Like, no one gets to go off and just hang out on their own. Like, I'm just going to take Humvee, and me and my buddy, we're going to go driving and see what we can do. You know, like, that doesn't happen. Um, it kind of accidentally happened with me once. But... <laughs> it didn't but it's not the it norm, right? It's not the norm. Like, if you're right. all by yourself, it, like, it, something's me, messed up. Me and my buddy were trying to get over to another uh, fob where they had the bank, and we were waiting for the bus, and the bus didn't come, and these... Uh, uh, they used to call them mercenaries, and now they're contract, you know... Contract. Just, just a name change, right? Yeah, name change is that. They pull up in their SUV, they're like, you guys need a ride? And we're like, yes, we could use a ride. And then we get in and we start going and I think to myself, this is like how zombie movies start. Because <laughs> we're leaving the base, driving over these people we don't know, you know, loaded up. So literally a zombie, a zombie audio podcast. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, but yeah, like there's things like that that they get wrong a lot on how procedures will take place. It takes a lot to actually go out and do something, at least in the army. You know, it's got to go through a huge chain of command with people making decisions, going over the plan of action, what are the dangers that are going to be involved. It's it's a huge process to make anything happen. How many, how many of you have seen Top Gun? <laughs> how many of you think that was a correct movie? <laughs> Tom Cruise in it. Obviously, it's hundred percent correct. Not even freaking close. Not even the volleyball. <laughs> For one, it was kind of, sort of filmed at Miramar. The airplanes, if you go back and look at it, or if you noticed it the first time, the F-14s have their wings forward. They're only doing 250 knots. Actual closure rate on a air-to-air -air combat is in the neighborhood of 1,200 miles an hour. So a bug on a windscreen, like you would see in your car, two seconds later is an airplane going by you at 600 miles an hour, you're doing 600 miles an hour. When they break, you're pulling nine and a half to 10 Gs. If you do not train every day to do that, you black yourself out instantaneously. The other thing is, in true air combat, you almost never see the other aircraft you're fighting. The turkey, which is what the Tomcat's actually called by Navy people, is big enough that you can see that far enough away to shoot it with a missile, turn around and leave, and they never even know you're there. That's true air to air combat. Landing on a carrier, they make it look all easy. How many of you have had a hard landing in a civilian airliner? Okay. Your hard landing in a civilian airliner is less impact than that Navy airplane takes every time it hits the deck. It's effectively about a 400 foot per minute rate of descent. The best you can have in a landing is what's called an OK3 wire. That means they can use the airplane again and they can use the pilot again. <laughs> the tail hook is good for 10 landings, the tires are good for 10 landings. That's if nothing goes wrong. That's a big if. Yeah. Something always goes wrong. Yep. Have you ever seen uh, the movie Memphis Bell? That's one of the more accurate, just to give you the feel of what it's like inside a bomber when you're in combat or you're flying in combat conditions. The airplane just shakes all the time. You're pu they're, they're people puking. You're breathing, you're breathing pure oxygen. You, which by the way, after breathing pure oxygen for 10 hours, you come home, you go to sleep, your ears hurt because the, the, the tissues consume all that oxygen and create a vacuum inside your ears. You're exhausted. It, that, that's about the only thing that's accurate about that movie in modern combat, but the shaking, the... He talked about boredom. It is. It's boredom punctuated by moments of stark terror. <clears throat> which you train for and you've got to react to. You've got to react to, right. And one of the reasons why we see so much dehumanization in military training is because you have to react 
instantaneously. Otherwise, people die. Has anybody seen Tears of the Sun? You're going to tell me how it's wrong. Oh, there's a lot wrong with <laughs> uh, I mean, Bruce Willis is a Navy SEAL in uh, Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, Hawaii. Nigeria. Nigeria. What? <laughs> Hawaii. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, anytime, particularly a bunch of grunts or recon marines or anybody who knows that field of endeavor sits down and watches a military movie, we nitpick it to death. We will, we will go to great lengths to find stuff. <laughs> For example, the uh, aim point is a style of red dot reflex sight that Bruce Willis has mounted on his M4 carbine in that movie. Mounted backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and we notice that sort of thing. I bet it looks better now. It looks better. It looks better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you've got, the, you've got these seals coming up out of the water and doing this long range movement. Not a single one of them has a rucksack on its back. Now, Maybe SEALs think they can do it differently. I've, I've run into situations like that before. But you need to carry a lot if you're moving cross-country long distance on a military operation. And guess where it's all going? On your back. And that's why many of us have bad backs and screwed up shoulders and messed up feet. Because we've been carrying two-thirds of our body weight on our backs for however long our careers have been. Um, who's seen 13 Hours? Nobody's seen 13 Hours. It's on Netflix right now, but... Yep, just, well, just came available. A particular, it's a Michael Bay movie, so this should probably have been expected, <laughs> <laughs> but... Oh, that one, yes, I have watched it. Yeah, yeah that's very good. <laughs> There's a point where a 40 millimeter grenade, which is basically a 40 mil, a, a big explosive 40 millimeter bullet shot out of a, an under barrel grenade launcher, hits a technical. Technicals are a term for usually Toyota Hilux pickups that have a gun mounted crudely in the back. So this 40 millimeter hits is technical and blows it in half in a massive fireball. Explosions aren't cool. Like, no. They don't have gasoline in them to make the big, you know, thing. Like, grenades, are, it's just a pop. It's a puff of smoke. Uh -huh. It's a puff of smoke and dust and kind of a thud. There's uh, uh, one of the Rambo, I think it was the last Rambo movie, he uses what they call a Claymore mine, which is... Basically the size of that uh, iPad the, there. The, the yeah. mushroom cloud. The mushroom cloud. And he plants it there. It's a forward-facing anti-personnel mine. He plants it there and they trip it off. And it's almost like a small nuclear weapon just yeah. went off. And it's like exploding outward and knocking down all the trees and everyone's running from it. Yeah, that, that's not how it works. <laughs> In fact, uh, you know... Uh, it, it looks a lot like a grenade blast. Yeah. It's, it's smoke and dust and, another, again, a thud. And you don't want to be anywhere near it because... You can't see the ball bearings that are flying out of that like a shotgun blast to tear you to pieces. In fact, uh, so terrorists actually, when they do like a car bomb, will load it in the back with gasoline so the guy who's filming it so they can use it for propaganda makes it look like a Hollywood explosion. Yeah. Because that's what the so explosions are supposed to look uh -huh, like. That's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> Is anybody seen Lone Survivor? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that is very close to... The actual. Uh, very good movie. It's Except for the ending, none of that crap happened. Yeah. Well, Hollywood endings always happen. Hollywood endings, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Except when you're trying to tell us what is ostensibly a true story. Uh -huh. yeah. So, okay, question. Sure. Um, I've heard from a friend of mine that was Marine that in the movies they actually switch the uniform, like where the medals are or something. There, so that if that has happened, there. There's, a, there's been a rumor floating around that there's some regulation that that's required. It's no. bull crap. There is okay. no such regulation. Any bad uniforms, and there are plenty <laughs> of them, yeah. are because of laziness and a, fa a failure to research. Yeah. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. And, and it does get pretty complex. So you pour, you know, those can sometimes get pretty complex. But the thing is, they are public record, right? Like, yes. if you really want to find, there is a not regimental that, record that will tell you everything. That. There are manuals of metal <laughs> residents. Because if there's an Emmanuel, how's a staff sergeant supposed to yell at you when you get it wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, especially, especially in an, in an infantry uh, specialty like I was, I was, you don't wear those uniforms very often. So when word comes down from the echelons beyond reality that, <laughs> hey, we, we've got an alphas inspection or, hey, we're going to be in blues for such and such, it's like, ah, oh, hell, i got to rebuild my stack. Don't I? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but let's make actually a good point here that I think is, is really important, is that there are some falsities that are made for a convenience of Hollywood or storytelling, right? Explosions sometimes. It's better if explosion looks cool. And if that's if it's that style of movie, you want it to look cool. But there are some sometimes somewhat <coughs> malicious misunderstanding of how the military operates. And it also there's some of it that's just it's propaganda. Top Gun some is Navy are, propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. Some things are malicious. Yeah. yeah. Anything malicious. anything having to do with nuclear weapons that you see oh, in the yeah, movies yeah. is propaganda. <laughs> but Top Gun, they need to be able to film these actors looking mm. good and not looking like they're blacking out. So obviously we can't film it at 600 miles per hour. We gotta tone that down, right? Well, actually what <laughs> happened was the Clay Lacey was flying the Learjet they were using for the camera burden. And they did a real world head-to-head -head pass with uh, Rat Willard flying the F-14 and I forget who was in the, uh, the F-5. But basically it was okay Count down three, two, one. Now hit it, and the camera bird basically went. What the f was that? <laughs> they got nothing. <laughs> At 24 frames a second, they got nothing but the tail end of one airplane as it went out of frame. <laughs> so obviously, there's some logistical considerations yeah. to be made right. when you're when you're displaying warfare on right. film, and maybe you know technological implications. It might be even just like. Nobody wants to watch a movie with six hours of people waiting no. in a in a jump in, in an airplane, right? It's right. like, well, yeah, like what was, the, what the, was movie? the Navy SEALs that made the, their own movie? They actually had real Navy SEALs. Act, the Act of Valor. Uh, Act, Act of Valor. Valor. It has like two scenes in there that are briefings. Yeah, those are boring in real life too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, except in real life, they're longer. Yeah, they're much <laughs> longer. <laughs> and everybody is looking, her, especially at the end. Really? And this this is even more so um, just not not miss so much mission briefings, but the the everyday BS briefings that you've got to sit through. <laughs> At the end, when they get to, does anyone have any questions? Everybody is giving his buddies the stink yeah. eye, like, like let don't, one of you so yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't even you open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Hollywood and other stuff, technical considerations behind, what are the most malicious misunderstandings of military culture? And David, you're actually touching yeah, on that. So let's start with you. nuclear weapons. Um, and is there a reason why, particularly? There's a reason why, is because um, People in Hollywood want to eliminate nuclear weapons. Yeah. Okay, um, nuclear weapons aren't anywhere near as destructive as they're portrayed. Um, it takes they're they're extremely difficult to detonate. Okay, so the idea of but twenty four has taught me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you if you, the idea that somebody can build one and get it to work, they're they're hard to get to detonate. It, you've got is. There are so many levels, I, I can't, if flying a B-52, I couldn't drop a bomb. I mean, I could drop it, but it's just going to go down and hit the ground, and the biggest danger is that it might leak some radiation, okay? It takes a, a specific code to, to uh, be able to drop it, and we would drop, we'd be flying at 200 feet in a 200 foot, 200, uh, foot wingspan aircraft, and we drop a nuke out the, out the bomb bay, and it would deploy a little drag chute and it would float down and hit the ground and then we would slam the throttles forward and do everything we could to get out of the area before the timer went off before it exploded okay a bomb that's detonated at, at ground zero doesn't do a ton of damage and you're trying to put it right on top of that bunker right on top of that missile silo if you don't you're not going to destroy it. Um, a bomb detonated from high altitude, that's going to do a lot of damage to, stru to structures, people, EMP, all of that. But we're, we're laying down tons of these things. And the idea that you can destroy the world 
with nuclear, with all the nuclear weapons seven times over? Yeah, if every government in the world co decided to cooperate in destroying the world and we're going to place them exactly here. No, you're going to render some parts uninhabitable for a while, but you're going to drop those weapons, you're going to fly to some base, you're going to refuel, you're going to fly back home, you're going to reload, and you're going to keep doing that until the enemy surrenders. Nuclear war is, the way they portray it in the movies, is completely dishonest. Okay, Clark? Um, I don't know that this is necessarily in movies, but uh, see it, you know, there's been videos that have come out online, you'll have uh, where soldiers... Uh, people that are fighting, you know, like actual right. real combat, and, and videos. right, and then uh, you know, people are like, "Oh, I can't believe they're saying things like that," with talking about like dark humor, you know, and to be able to do this job, like, takes something to you have to get rid of something, right, and you have to be able to lighten the load, you have to be able to say things that you know that are very what macabre, yeah. you know, yeah. like, yeah. yeah, look at him go, look at him go, you know, just hit him, whatever. But that doesn't mean that that's how that person really is, and it doesn't mean that they don't go home afterwards and really think about that forever, right? You know, and we don't understand what's going on in those in those times, and to be able just to be like, give a blanket statement because that's not what you do when you go and work at um, Starbucks. You know, this is a different type of There's job. There's some pretty yeah. evil customer yeah. service people, they're, they're right? Awesome. Like, so, I mean, they have so, some redeeming qualities. Who's seen Full Metal Jacket? For sure. That movie actually got a lot right. As calculated as it is as a piece of anti-war and anti-Marine Corps propaganda, it actually did get a great deal correct. Which is why a lot of Marines really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, like you were saying, that particularly that scene in Vietnam where the dude's got his arm around the corpse, it rarely gets to that point unless it's been a really horrific set of circumstances, which does happen. I mean, like I said, our job is to kill people and break their stuff. And it's not a pretty job, it's not a glamorous job, and it takes its toll. And it can take its toll mentally as well as physically. Some bounce back from it, some don't. That's like really true for a lot of things in life, right? Man, a yeah. lot of yeah. horrific, horrific events. Gym, malicious things, volleyball and um, yeah, in Tonga, right? Uh, <laughs> Not that homoerotic in real, no. in real, in real Navy. Probably the portrayals of shipboard life. Uh, prisoners in jail have more physical space than a sailor does on a ship. Who has more physical space than you do in a submarine? Submarines are crowded. Even the the new nukes, very small living space. The portrayal, much like what David was talking about with the nuke from the airplane, the BN, what we call boomers, SSBNs, that carry the nuclear tip missiles, uh, multiple reentry uh, SSBN missiles, are portrayed so badly in most of these movies for much the same reason. You now. Yes, those missiles can take out specific locations. Yes, they're targeted to specific locations. Those submarines don't go out and sit there caught, just waiting, going, come on, come on, let me kill somebody, let me kill somebody. That is not what we do. Yes, to a certain extent, we're like the Marine Corps. Actually, we haul the Marine Corps out, dump them off, let them do what they do, we sit there and drink coffee. But <laughs> the portrayals inevitably are the bad COs, the bad crew that goes rogue. That is so much bull BS. I'll leave it at that. It's not funny. Bull donkey. <laughs> and it's an insult to every person that's worn the uniform, regardless of what service. It's an insult to every one of us. Because I can guarantee you every one of us sitting at this table have lost friends in crashes, in combat, in other things. <laughs> We live with those deaths every day. Every day. The rock. <laughs> well, and then so, good segue for that. 
how do you balance um, when you were active military? How did you balance your military life and your civilian life? How was how did that how did that switch? Like you know, from weekend to day job. Like how how did that go? Let's start with you, Pete. Mm-hmm. Just something something to to give our, our viewers. <laughs> Obviously, you could talk at length. <clears throat> Libo in the Marine in the Marine Corps it's called it's generally called Libo for Liberty is when at whatever time on Friday you get done you get cut loose until Monday morning most of the time I mean some units will try and enforce hey you got to have you got to have a battle buddy going out there with you particularly in recon no we went to the winds it's like <laughs> I see you every day, all day, for the rest of the week. I don't want to be around you on the weekends. Uh, again, in, in the old days, it was a lot stricter, but these days, it's like, Friday, you're cut loose. Try not to show up on the police blotter. <laughs> if you do, then you're gonna be standing in front of the first sergeant in the morning, on Monday morning. And usually, if he's a good first sergeant, the first words out of his mouth are going to be, did you win? <laughs> and if you say no, you're going to be in worse trouble than if you say yes. Greg Clark, how about you? Um, so, you know, transitioning back, coming back from the deployment, that was a really difficult time. Because uh, I, I was actually getting out, uh, I got my DD um, 214. 214, which means I was out of the military. Later on, I got back in with the National Guard. But making that transition out was one of the most difficult things because I had gone from daily important life, you know, checking vehicles for bombs, doing all the security, like everything mattered on a daily basis, 24 seven. And then I get back, I'm like, What's on TV? What, it, yeah, I kind of wander around the grocery store for three hours. I don't even remember why I'm there, you know, because it just feels so weird being back. And being back with my son, like my uh, my youngest, I mean, it had been with all the training, I had missed three years of his life, you know, getting ready for that deployment and during the deployment, and so like reintegrating with them and learning who they are. Now I came back with my little suitcase full of PTSD, and I've got these little outbursts, or someone slams a door, and I'm falling on the ground, you know, like it's just weird things, and everyone's having to make that adjustment back to a different life than what it was before I left. Dave. We came back from one uh, TDY, and uh, my young son didn't want to have anything to do with me. He he didn't recognize me. I was just this strange guy, and actually, I came back from the deployment with a beard because we were under we weren't exactly in, uh, incognito, but we weren't allowed to wear uniforms because of the country we were in, what we were doing. Yeah. And, uh, he did, you know, there were a lot of things. He just didn't want to have anything to do with me, and that really... It, it took him a couple of months to warm up to me again, and uh, that really struck me. We're very close, and we became very close after that, but uh, that was one of the things that really... Air Force is a little different in that we kind of go out into the dangerous part, then we come home. So it's kind of this thing, you get up in the morning, you're going to go risk your life, and you're going to come back and have dinner. And you do that all the time. The other thing, though, was that when we would go on TDYs and, and, and um, there was this tremendous pressure one young lady was asking about uh, women in the military. The pressure on female troops to give sexual favors is horrific. And the brass covers it up. And you go out on these deployments, you go out on these TDYs, and, they're, and the pressure to get you to go do something that you won't want to tell your, your wife about is terrible because that's what the only thing they'll have over you to cover up what they're doing when they get back. And I'm sorry to kind of put that spin on it, but that you don't you don't go to the strip clubs with them, they don't trust you. You don't drink with them, 
They don't trust you. And to come back and look the wife in the eye of the navigator on my crew, I never did. I never ratted on them. But I wish I had in some cases. Look her in the eye, knowing what her husband had done while he was out there. That's a little, that's a little different aspect on it. But that's that culture, condition. that pressure, especially on the female troops, is horrible. All right, Jim? Um, I guess a slightly different take on what Dave had. Uh, I was in during Vietnam. So we had uh, R&R sites. Navy typical deployment is six to nine months, whether it's a ship, a submarine, or an air squadron. So where Dave was talking about, he's coming back on a routine basis. We would leave, we would be gone six to nine months. We would base out of one location. Uh, for example, for us, a lot of times it was the Philippines. And the Philippines is pretty well known as a hot spot for liberty. Some people call it R&R, &R, some call it I&I. &I. Intoxication, and you can guess what the other one was. But you would, uh, there was a very good presentation run by a guy's uh, PhD from NAMI, Naval Aerospace Medical, called Sex in the Naval Aviator. Talked about compartmentalization and how aviators tended to deal with the deployment syndrome and things going on at home, where you would actually start shifting into the deployment mode a month ahead of time, where you would start that cycle of, okay, I'm getting ready to go, I've got to do all these things to meet the quals, get ready to go, we're flying our ass off to get up to speed to go on deployment. You go on deployment, this is before the internet, anything else. You got a letter maybe once a month. You wrote maybe three or four letters a month. Those letters maybe or maybe not got home, depending on where you were. If you were on a destroyer, for example, the mail comes on and off of the helicopter. The helicopter crashes, your mail's gone. You know, you, sh you show up six months later, the wife's going, what the hell, you never wrote me the entire time. <laughs> you know, and you're going, no, I wrote you once a month. You know, you start checking back. There were five helicopter crashes. Every one of those pieces of mail were gone. So there was a huge disconnect between what was going on at home and what was going on in employment. Yeah, Navy guys played around. To be very honest. We had the highest divorce rate during the Vietnam era. It was 55%. I know the squadron that I was in, we had 52 divorces out of 74 married couples in one six-month deployment. Now, to your point of today, what are the women doing? Now, one of my cohorts in flight school, when I got commissioned, is still today a female Navy astronaut, Kay Hire. Her last mission was she was on 130. She designed and installed a couple on the ISS. So that was her project for two years. And right now, she is working with SpaceX on the next version of Spam in a Can. Uh, Both very important things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it depends on what era you're talking about. But at least from the Navy perspective, with the ones that I've worked with in the last few years as a civilian, there's a lot more openness, a lot more availability for flying positions, including combat. Although we did lose Hulgren uh, in the uh, infamous F 14 crash. There's a lot of different reasons for that and I won't go into. But the opportunities are there. So it's basically a limitation of the number of, be number of seats available and the performances they come out of different things. I can actually, sure. I didn't really get into the transition part too much, but uh, Clark's bit reminded me. My first deployment, we were in probably the biggest firefight the battalion had gotten into in the entire deployment about three weeks before I got home. Three weeks is an awful short time to go from 
some podunk village in Zidon, Iraq, getting shot at by probably the biggest gun that anybody in the battalion's ever gotten shot at. It was a 14.5 millimeter KPV. Oh. Biggest muzzle flash I've ever seen in my life. Would have gone through one of our trucks long ways if they'd actually been able to shoot, which fortunately they couldn't. And then three weeks later, I'm stateside seeing commercials and billboards and people just blissfully ignorant of that moment of lethal clarity is the best way I can describe it. When I came very close to actually being killed by friend by friendly fire during that fight as one of the other gunners on our side had did not know where our truck was and swept our truck with a 240 golf uh, 240 golf which is a 7 762 millimeter machine gun I had moved fortunately I had moved just before it happened so I was sheltered but when I went back to my spot I hear this hissing sound, and of course we're still taking fire from the bad guys at, the, at this point. I hear this hissing sound, and I glance down, and there's a bullet hole in the rim of the tire right below me, and just a quick little look at the angle, and that would have gone right below my black back plate and tore my guts out. It's a very immediate sort of thing when you realize how close you've come to having not only that, but having your head blown off because there were some very big bullets coming towards us from the other direction. A 14.5 millimeter round projectile itself is about the size of my thumb. You go from that to say, if you're walking down the street in Provo here. Culture shock doesn't Culture quite speed. cover. <laughs> um, we got time for, we got three minutes left, so does anyone have any press questions they'd like to ask? Sure. How can we as civilians show our appreciations and support for this terrible transition and the, the hard life and service that you do. Anybody want to feel this? Um, so my father served in World War II, and at that time it was 20% of the U.S. population was involved in the war, which meant that if it wasn't your brother or you know your father or someone who was going over there, it was a friend on your street. During the deployments over the last 10 years, it was 0.5% of the U.S. population. So it's just, it's getting to know people. It's, it's trying to understand, you know. I, I have people come up, you know, and say, thank you for your service, which, which is great. But, you know, the, we're having, is it 22 per day yeah. that they're saying for suicides? Well, I, you know, I mean, it's not really 22 per day, but, like, yeah. the, the number overall that, for suicide that's, is high. That's including a lot of the... Uh, the older guys, the homeless guys, mm -hmm. who already had quite a few problems otherwise. But it's a serious issue, you know, and uh, trying to, to figure out and how to do it. I got fired from a job, really honestly, because of my PTSD. Like, they made up a different excuse for it, but it was because of that. And that really sucked. <laughs> you know, that really sucked. So, it, you know, trying, if you know someone who is a soldier, just trying to actually understand, but don't be like, oh, tell me, did you kill anybody? You know, that is what, the worst. What, you know, what happened? You know, like, it's just, it's trying to be... It's treated like human beings. Human, right? yeah. yeah. And if understand their situation, that it's very unique in our society today. Did you ever kill anybody is the most personal question you can ever ask. <coughs> yeah. it, it's, I mean, it, it's like walking up to a complete stranger and asking them about their sexual habits. It's about the same level of personal level of that question. Sure. We do one more question. Uh, yeah, tied into that, what's, what is a good question to ask? Like, where, where, where have you traveled to? I mean, like... <laughs> I usually ask MOS, but what do you guys do? <laughs> How about the sea? I mean, is there a good question? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll treat us like people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean... If we want to talk about it, we will. Quite honestly, most <laughs> most guys, when, when you walk up and say, hey, thank you for your service, we don't know what the hell to say to you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. it's, it's, thank you uh, for saying thank you. Like, I guess, <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird feeling. So. Plus, it's a Navy SEAL, because you don't know who Navy SEAL is. Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> hey, this has been so interesting, guys. I want to thank you and for the information. And if we want to learn more about the real deal, like, if you have any recommendations on where we live, because obviously, like, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is a work of fiction. It is not in any way autobiographical. It is not a true story couched as fiction. It is far more exciting than anything 99% of real gunfighters <laughs> ever <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, and probably the favorite acronym is not an official one, but it is FUBAR. Yeah. <laughs> <It's mine. laughs> Um, I've got uh, three books that are currently out, Another Day, Another Name. I actually wrote this while I was in Iraq. Um, it's not about Iraq, but just some of the thoughts and ideas that I had over there. It's a thriller I uh, write for middle grade, for fantasy adventure in the 1930s with an uh, uh, Egyptian theme. And then you can catch me on uh, the Book Editor Show, which is a podcast, or Writership. And uh, sometimes a self-publishing podcast, I'm on there because I work over there too. So. Favorite acronym. Funny oh, figure oh, um, FDIC. So, <laughs> FDC. Also, they sometimes call it Fresh Donuts and Coffee, but it's Fire Direction Control. <laughs> Noticing a bit of a trend here. Some, some, yeah. some I, uh, <laughs> I write uh, LDS horror. Strangely, though, all of my male protagonists are ex. Uh, Air Force aviators. <laughs> <laughs> you think that write what you know, literally. Yeah, write what you know. And, uh, I have a trilogy out called The Children of Lilith, and I, my latest release is called The Sweet Sister. And um, and I have a, a, a weapons, medieval swords and spears and axes, oh my, uh, tomorrow morning in this room at 9 o'clock. You get to handle the arsenal. <laughs> and, uh, and my favorite acronym is Buff, you know what we call the B-52 stands for big, ugly, fat fellow. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming to our panel. We're only six minutes over, so please forgive us. Thank you so much.